welcome to the Spark of Ages podcast, where we're going to talk to founders, innovators, CEOs, investors, designers, and artists. I'm talking game changers about their big world-shaping ideas and what sparked them. I'm your host, Rajiv Parikh, and I am the CEO and founder of Position Squared, a growth marketing company based in Palo Alto. So yes, I'm a Silicon Valley entrepreneur, but I'm also a business news junkie and a history nerd. I'm fascinated by how big world-changing movements go from the spark of an idea to an innovation that reshapes our lives. In every episode, we're going to do a deep dive with our guest about what led them to their own Eureka moments and how they're going about executing it, perhaps most importantly, how they get to get other people to believe in them so that their idea could also someday be a spark for the ages. This is the Spark of Ages podcast. For our conversation today, we have Sumit Chain. He's currently a managing partner at a secondary VC fund. I've had the great fortune of meeting Sumit during the pandemic, of all things. And uh, we are both extroverts. We were both losing our minds uh, at home and not being able to travel. And we, along with a group of other similarly minded folks, got to know each other. And we just had spectacular conversations. Um, he has... You guys potted. You basically created a, a pod of extrovert Silicon right. Valley bros. Kind of. <laughs> yeah. We created a, it was, it's almost like a pandemic fraternity. And uh, the one piece of learning I'd say I got out of the pandemic is that I know every bar that's open till <laughs> two o'clock up and down the peninsula. Thanks to Sumit. <laughs> right. <laughs> Don't blame me. And I others. Have, yes, but... yes. I'll point the finger at others. <laughs> but yes. Yes. yes Human yes, Yelp. Exactly. So that was one. Which, by the way, I think is there's like three of them. So and we know all three of them. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Amazing. So that's why I thought Subit would be great because he could bring us some really interesting perspectives. He's uh, done the traditional Indian route of growing up in Buffalo, uh, New York. Uh, going to an Ivy League school, somehow doing really well there and uh, getting a job. I think you were in sales at one point in your life. I was. That's right. I was in sales at a software company. So I was software. a management consultant first and then sales oh, at a software right. company. So yeah. And then and then went to business school at a at a lonely place called Wharton. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, at UPenn down in Pennsylvania. And then after many it had many different interesting roles, but everything from investment banking to uh, venture capital to eventually being his own entrepreneur as a venture capitalist. So I thought this would be super fun to talk about. Uh, he's got very interesting views on the market in the world and entrepreneurship, and I just thought we'd have a lot of fun. So I, I was wondering, like, Sumit, like, there's a there's like a recession, or there's supposed to be a recession. Everybody kept saying we're going to be in a recession, right? Stocks went to hell or at least all the stocks that got pumped up to nowhere, went to hell. And we were supposed to be in this terrible recession. There's like the freaking Ukraine war with Russia. Russia attacked Ukraine. Oil prices spike, uh, spike. We all who got into the stock club lose a bunch of money. And we were supposed to be in this ugly recession. When's it going to happen? Yeah. I mean, look, what, technically we've had it. <laughs> you know, I think we had a little bit of a recession, you know, and we're, and we're back. I, I think that... You know, we've talked about this at length. Um, inflation is not a recession, but has somewhat similar effects, right? It makes everyone feel a little bit less rich. Um, everyone's got a little bit less stuff. And and I remember when the pandemic first started, um, you know, Wharton professor Jeremy Siegel, you know, he had a he had a lecture and 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 you know and, and for the alumni, and he said something like, "You know, look, the way we get out of this recession is, and and all the stimulus is to inflate ourselves out of it, and it's kind of what's gone on, right? And um, I don't, you know, there's, uh, you know, you've one of the things I've learned from you, Rajiv, at some point, um, is that unfortunately, unfortunately, the, the U.S. economy used to have a certain amount of unemployment to to work to work kind of correctly." I think, we just like don't five, have that. I think it was like 5%, right? 5%. Right. So five out of a hundred people who are in the, are supposed to be employed, who say they are, they want to be employed. 
normally that's considered like an awesome economy because there's enough people who've quit who want to find jobs and there's enough people who who uh, are, have been let go and aren't like asking for too much money. So like there's this nice balance between how much companies are willing to pay people and how much people want in comp. And so that's considered great. And yet we've had this economy that says it's like labor shortage, like 3.4, now 3.7% unemployment. That's amazing, right? Yeah. So I just don't know how, and, and maybe I'm wrong. I don't know if historically we've ever had a recession with, with a labor shortage, right? Like the the two to me are incongruous, right? You, like it's 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 you know the, that Venn diagram doesn't overlap. So, um, and we've we've tried, you know, we're ratcheted up interest rates, you know, and sitting in Silicon Valley, it feels like oh gosh, there's layoffs. But as we know, tech is such a small smart part of the economy that the overall economy is kind of humming. So I just don't. I'm just it's unclear to me that until unemployment shifts dramatically, you will really see, you know, a classical yeah, like, yeah, recession. Like you, go from, you go from interest rates, right, at almost zero. Like, we were all, what, refinancing our houses. Yeah. Right? We, I don't know. I, I think some, some of us got 30-year rates at, like, 2.5%. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, which you think is, you're just paying principal off at that point, right, the principal of your mortgage. And now it's cranked up from the, that zero to 5%, which means there's, there's like interest rates now at 6%, right? So it's almost like in a, a four or five, three or four X rise in interest rates. And that's just not, that's for low risk stuff, like a, a house. But you know, if you're talking about car, it's higher. If you're talking about credit card debt, it's even higher. So that's supposed to slow things down. It's supposed to, it just hasn't happened yet, right? And look, you see, okay, this credit card debt increasing, yes. Um, you know, you're probably seeing the same things I'm seeing that, you know, there's some some um, replacement happening at places like Costco, you know, switching from beef to pork and, yeah. um, you know, and... No um, eggs. Eggs, no eggs. eggs yes, shot up. Exactly. Yeah, like, oh, that's right. right. And um, so eggs to you know, pork. <laughs> yeah, buying staples at, at dollar stores. And so, so, you know, you're seeing some of that, but, uh, you know, it, it still isn't, you know, it, it's, it's a reduction in demand. It's a reduction in people's spending, but it's not recession, right? It's yeah. not, it's, yeah. it's people less are still getting jobs. Yeah, people are still getting jobs. They still, if they quit, they could find something. I mean, I the, our friends who may have gotten laid off from Meta or Facebook, they're not like they're not dying. They're they're finding other jobs. Maybe yeah. I don't know if it's for less. I mean, I've I've tried to hire some of these folks, and they they want some big numbers. So I'm sure someone else is paying those big numbers, or they're they're just resizing. But yeah. for the most part, it so like we keep seeing these forecasts, and it affected the stock market for a long time. We keep seeing these forecasts, which would say it was supposed to go, like it was going to be a recession, like you say, a real recession, people out of work, people suffering. And then those forecasts, like they were supposed to be at 50-50. Yeah. And now I heard that Goldman Sachs is saying it's 25%. I know you talked to a number of folks yeah. there as part yeah. of your job. Yeah. What are these guys saying? Uh, you know, I think every quarter that goes by, we don't see it. If you remember this, you know, we talked about this Q3 of last year. And if you remember, we actually saw a bunch of slides from Goldman Sachs. And the whole notion was, if you don't, basically every quarter you don't see a recession, the likelihood of a recession declines. So we didn't really see it Q1, Q2, we know where, you know, we're going to enter Q3 soon. And so, you know, every quarter where it's not there, the likelihood of actually it happening declines. And so I, I, I think that, they're all in that same place, which is it's possible, but that possibility declines. And I, you know, I don't know if we're going to see it or if it's going to get worse. So the one thing that I still worry a little bit about is yeah. the overhang of real like estate. Debt, right? Yeah, commercial, debt and, and commercial, commercial, real estate. commercial real estate right. and residential after that. And what, you know, I think we're in the early innings of that. And we see what's going on in San Francisco as an example in the commercial real estate, which is which is not pretty. Um, there's a lot of ripple to that, which I don't know, um, candidly, how that how bad that gets in terms of, you know, when those things get unwound, who's actually left holding the bag, where the creditors are. 
Um, and I don't, I, that could get unwound pretty bad. I just don't know yet. And, um, and I don't think, I don't, so so does that does that change the way people live and how they buy stocks and how they buy things? What is normal now? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, um, we I remember we looked at this chart once, you know, that just the the duration of time between um, you know, peak to trough declines every cycle. And I tend to think that, you know, what we see, for example, in the technology world of just the pace of innovation and how quickly new trends take off and you know, I'm sure we'll talk about lots of stuff in, in tech, right? But that also is happening from a economic perspective. The cycles are getting shorter, you know, the resilience. And so if if there is a shift and one part of this one part of the economy is challenged, you have another part of the economy that can that makes up for it really right. quick. So which, maybe it's like a it was like a it was like a rolling recession, right? It was like yeah, a bit, different right. sectors getting hit. So like shipping costs went up eighty percent or hundred. No, like plus the rolling blackouts that we keep having down in LA. But so yeah. so why why is the market up? Is is the, is that why the the Nasdaq is up thirty percent? Because you know, in spite of knowing that real estate is 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 this problem, is, is uh, why is it happening yeah. right now? You know, you know what's funny is that. <laughs> You know, my portfolio we talked about good? this. I feel like we, you know, we, we had this. We, we looked at this chart um, Q4 last year, and we actually brought it up in front of our stock club, which was, you know, the stock market reflects the future, not today. And um, what that means is, if we think that the trough has happened. Or that the trough is even one quarter from now, the stock market's really reflecting where you think, where the market thinks the economy and valuations will be six to 12 to 18 months from now. So, is this so sorry from the like layman's point of view, like is this because everybody just thinks AI is going to be super profitable? Like, what are we enthused about? I think we, the I think the market generally thinks that one year from now, Things will be all right, and what happens over the next year might be a little choppy here or there, but we're for more focused on the future. And I think that I think that that's the bigger thing. Yeah, I, I think this is one of these really amazing phenomenons. And usually, uh, one of the things Sumit pointed out in one of those graphs was that in the third year of the first term of a new president, typically. The market. This is I think you had data going back to 1920. Yeah, it goes it. it it goes up 8% that year. So other right. years were mixed because there's so many different variables, but that what, was the what interesting happens, one. What happens in election years? So this is the year prior to the election year. I know. So what happens in election years? I think it's still slightly up, right? Yeah, but this is the, the largest. And I think the, the, the reason is, is that um, there is typically not substantial um uh, you know major policy shift because you've got an incumbent looking for re-election and they kind of want to they don't want to stir the pot too much and um and that just sort of leads to a kind of confidence around what you know that things will be okay there's not gonna be a lot of change and then and it's actually stood the test of time so it may not happen this time right these are things about averages but but it's a really interesting thing. So then, then here's the part: the second term, if the person wins the second term, then things get bad. <laughs> right, <laughs> Which is right, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, now, yeah. now you're in this whole secondary. You're a secondary VC, right? Now you've been a primary VC, and now you're a secondary VC. What the hell does that mean? Yeah. So. Um, and, and, and interesting enough, I feel like secondaries are now hot. Are they just not loved? Are you guys just <laughs> yeah, not loved not, enough? No, you're you know, um, you're kind of like the second wife, or the second <laughs> mistress. Okay, sure. I thought about that one. <laughs> but the, um, the, hey, what, you know, what's, how the do you, notion well, is... Why do you assume the second wives are unloved? I feel like that would be... <laughs> <laughs> know, in all the Hindu literature, actually, it's pretty good to be the second one. Yeah. Oh, really? So, I don't know. Maybe the third. <laughs> about to do more reading on Hindu literature. <laughs> um, or not. <laughs> Or we can let the patriarchy die out with that. That's cool. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we can move on. Yeah. If you think of the stock market, the NASDAQ, New York Stock Exchange, et cetera, those are basically secondary markets. And what I mean by that is 
you're buying shares in one company from somebody else who owns those shares. And the vast majority on the public market side, the vast majority we think of, of buying and selling shares in companies, it's all secondary market. Right? Somebody owns something and somebody else buys it. Now, and that's, that's the majority of the market. On the private market side, when you think of venture capital, typically you're investing money and that money is going to the company and that company is giving you shares in their company. So it's called primary because essentially you're investing directly in that company and they're giving you shares. Well, what secondary investing essentially means is its corollary is kind of the stock market. When I'm buying shares in a company, rather than going straight to that company and buying shares from them, I'm buying it from somebody who already has it, kind of the way that stock market may work. However, in the private market, it's far less efficient, largely because there's a information isn't disclosed. You have to be credentialized. There's a, a whole bunch of restrictions. Right, I mean, you, and you just can't. Yeah, you just can't go to your Schwab account and go sell. That's right? right. You bought these shares. They they told you what they told you. You believe what you believe. They can show you their books. You can do a bunch of due diligence, which is expensive. That's right. right? It's not just openly disclosed. Yep. The same stuff you filed to the SEC. That's been, it may have been audited, may not have been, but you have to believe it. And then you're making your purchase based on that. And if you don't want it anymore, it's not exactly like it's a place where you can just dump your, that's right. dump your equity. And, and usually there's a lot of restrictions, which is to say that when you first buy those shares from that company, you agree with that company on a whole bunch of stuff, including if you don't want those shares anymore, you either can't sell them or you can only sell them to certain people or you can, you know, and then there's a lot of that stuff that you have to abide by. It's not just common shares. So that's kind of, that. that's what I do. And um, the big, you know, there's some big drivers um, around this. One of which is that a lot of the best tech companies today stay private longer. And one of the reasons they stay private longer is because there's a lot more growth capital available than there used to be. It used to be, you know, um, that a company, if you go back and look at, Companies like Microsoft or Apple or Intuit and, you know, these companies went public when they were hundreds of millions of dollars in valuation, much, much, much smaller from a revenue perspective, from all metrics, they went public and they needed to because they needed to go access capital from public investors to continue to build and grow. And, and even Amazon, et cetera, much smaller companies that went public. Today, what you end up having is lots of private growth investors who are able to continue to fund those companies till they get bigger and larger as private companies. And then when they eventually go public, they might be a billion dollars or $10 billion or even bigger at that time. So, okay, all that makes sense. Well, what now changes is those first investors or those first employees or those founders they in the they, past, yeah, they've, been, they've been sitting on it for like like five or th like 10, seven, 15, 10 years. 15 years, yeah, right? That's right. And a lot of those early investors, you know, frankly, when that, you know, they might have invested in a company when it was worth $10 million. And okay, and, and, and at some point in the future, the company might be worth $100 million. And they'll say, gosh, I would love to get 10 times my money back if I could. That's a great return for me. Even though the company has ambitions of being a billion dollar company, growing another 10x, um, but that might take another five to 10 years. And at, at a certain point, somebody just may say, look, I would love to get 10x my money back. And as long as there's a buyer on the other side of that, which is me, I'll say, great, I'll love to buy you out at, I don't really care what you paid. If I buy in at a price today that I like, and I think that there's still a lot of upside from here. That's great. It helps solve a problem for lots of people. Right. So that guy could, that man or woman, the founder, could yep. go buy themselves a house. They could pay for their kids. They could, they could get some what they call liquidity. Because a lot of times when we start up, when when entrepreneurs start up companies, they're taking compared to the big companies lower salary. They're not getting these yearly bonuses. They're not what they call getting like these stock grants that even like Tesla factory employees got. That they're not getting any of that, and they can't do much with it. So they they want to go do something with it. And so your company comes around and says, "Hey, I got I got a deal for you." Right, right, right. 
I got to do it for yeah, you. I'll buy you like, I'm then, wow, this is really giving. So this is like how you know founders are are end up being cash poor kind of a thing, and this is a way they can. That's right. Is, is that is that the idea? Well, I mean, this is a way yeah, for them to, or, or yeah, for founders to get. Well, and it's not just founders, but founders is certainly one group where you know they have a lot of their net worth tied up in their company, and yeah. you know, and and frankly, it's it's good because you want. Well, it's good to get some liquidity because you kind of don't want a founder to have to be worried about feeding their family or paying for college for their kids. You'd rather than focus their time and attention on building their business. And if you can alleviate some of the stresses in their life, yeah, um, you know, you obviously want to still be aligned and they have still a lot of incentive to make that thing big. But, you know, taking a little bit of selling a little bit is totally fine and helps all involved. The other big group is just the early investors where early investors, um, you know, at some point you need some capital back and some returns to keep investing, right? And it's good for all involved if early investors, angel investors, seed investors, if they have investments that are illiquid for 15 years, well, they're going to have to slow down their investing because they need some money back to kind of keep reinvesting. And they want to get some of that capital back, not just, you know, in part so they can realize a return. Right. And, and some and some of these funds are like, you know, so you're like, oh, these are just rich people trying to get more money to be more, continue to be rich people. I'm but not going to say that's exactly how it sounded to me, but it did sound a little bit like that. <laughs> kind of like that. Oh, poor guy, <laughs> he needs to buy a Tesla. Oh, you yeah. know, but actually a lot of those funds who invest in venture capital and some of these seed funds are actually pension funds like union pension funds. They're actually college endowments and not just like Harvard, Stanford, UPenn, but like, you know, regular colleges, they put some of their equity in that. So there's a lot of money being cycled in that is now getting a chance to, to get that money out and put it into other things, maybe return it back, maybe use it to fund scholarships, maybe to use it to fund retirements. So that's, that's like, you guys are performing like this efficient, market function like well okay you're not going to go public for a while or you're not going to get acquired for a while but we're gonna you're gonna cut us a deal cut us a deal compared to what you previously got and then we're gonna wait till you go public or get acquired and then you're gonna make then that's how your investors are gonna make a bunch that's of money. right that's right and those yeah. also may be the same pension funds, endowments, and all of whatever. That's right. Right. And then, so this is how the whole machine keeps running. Yeah. And in many ways, funds the innovation economy, right? That's right. And, you know, there was actually an investor of, of, of ours who, um, the university, who during the pandemic had significant reduction in enrollment, so significant decline in tuition revenue, and was relying on their endowment to help fund school operations while they were cash flow negative, while they were losing money and, you know, and, and needed returns on some of the private investments that they were making to, you know, to provide actual liquid cash so that they could pay teachers and pay professors and do all the things that they needed to do. So, so you're exactly right. There's all sorts of different pockets uh, of capital that, you know, all funnels into endowments, pensions, into hospital systems, all these different things. And then it's the job of those groups to try to maximize return and they'll allocate it and say, we're going to put some stuff in real estate and put some stuff in public stock, put some stuff in government bonds and put some stuff in venture capital, which which provides a different risk reward. And, and, and all these things are balanced in different ways. And for venture capital, at some point you'll say, well, I'd, it'd be nice to get th that cash back. And that's where I think that's I can, cool. That's, that's where it'll help. That's cool. So you're in this part of the market and you get to see all these, like when you pick these companies, you're picking companies, like are you just buying a basket of companies that are super cool and super hot? Or are you like, what makes you, what makes you pick a company that you want to buy private equity for? Yeah. Like maybe, maybe even use one of your examples. Like I think you, you had a bunch of good exits. Yeah. I, I, you know, like I think um, ultimately it doesn't look that different than the way you would if you were just, I should say just, but, you know, venture capital investor, right? Where you have a thesis and you say, look, I'm really interested or, and let's say today it's in AI or in the past it might have been security or maybe it's consumer marketplaces or whatever it is. And, and then you'll spend time understanding 
the under the businesses there and which businesses are performing and why are they performing and what are the market dynamics and where is the technology important and what are the management teams? So all the typical vectors you would look at as a private equity investor um, to get to but to get to your thesis and build some conviction around individual companies, it's just that at that point, rather than saying, now I'm going to go talk to the company to go f- see if they will accept my capital, I'm instead talking to existing investors to say, could you use a little bit of liquidity? And and that's a little bit about how how that works. So, you know, you sort of start from the same place that you would as a as a typical private equity investor, and maybe even a public investor, right? You know, a lot of deep conviction public investors start with the same thing of what are, you know, why do I have conviction around investing in a certain company? And then we'll go buy those public stocks. So, so very, yeah, very your, your, your approach is kind of different, right? You're not just looking at every company. You look at particular companies. You really love them. Yep. And then you go to make friends with people who may hold their, their stock. That's right. And you say to them, hey, I want to buy that. And you're going to be friendly to the current investors. And so there's like, oh, maybe we'll work with. The, I like that guy Sumit. He's yeah. He's he's kind of a fun guy. He's a good guy, <laughs> and he's going to be friendly to the people who are still running the show. That's right. That's right. And so yeah, and and you know, the thing about you know the, these things happen at different layers, right? There's the companies that invest directly. Uh, there's the um, people who directly own those own those shares, which could be employees, could be founders. There's one level up which is the venture funds oftentimes have them. And so you might do a transaction where you're buying a bunch of different um, um, kind of investments from a venture firm. And then there's one level above that, which is the investors in those venture firms, the limited partners. And those are the pensions, endowments, hospitals, uh, all those groups where they might say, gosh, I would really love some liquidity. I've invested in this firm and that firm's got underlying investments and, and you could buy it out at that level, right? So there's yeah. all sorts of different levels. So there's lots of clever ways of playing it. So oh. like, how do you charm people into this stuff, Sabine? I mean, like, there's a lot of people out there with money. Like, what's your, what's your, how do you make, how do you get people to, to want to buy or to sell their shares to you? I mean, it, is it just being a value guy? Or are you just like showing them a bunch of numbers? Having a career that started in tech and started in venture, um, and, well, she started in tech and then went to venture, it goes a long way, which is um, usually folks like to talk to people who understand the business and understand what they're doing and aren't just sort of saying, I'm, I want to buy because I think it's cool or because I think it's sexy, but actually understand. And the reason that matters is, one, they have confidence, you know what you're getting into. And while I'm not... I'm not going to force myself into um, having an active role, but it could be helpful if needed, right? And so, and and so that ends up providing a lot of comfort to a seller as well that won't be a pain in the butt to the company. I know what I'm getting into. I understand the business. I understand the tech. I understand the risks. I understand what's going well. I understand what's not going well. Great. I know you're not going to be a pain in the butt to the company if not everything goes according to plan every single day. Right. No, because because no investor or no board member wants that long ass letter from some random shareholder. That's right. All jumping all over them. So like so Sumit, like you could have like this is the part that I love learning about, like what drives people and what makes you what gives that spark of innovation. Yeah. You could have you could have been an investment banker, maybe Goldman, you maybe have gone to Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan. You could have gone to a bunch of these firms. They seem to be living pretty nicely. Sure. I mean, they may be pretty stressed, but they seem nicely. But you decided that you would still be stressed and deciding maybe I wouldn't want any salary for a while and just because I had this dream of what? Like what, what drove that initiative to kind of create this yeah, to go st- go st- do something on your own like this, or yeah. with a couple partners. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a good question. I think a um, couple things. So, and by the way, I was an investment banker at Goldman Sachs, and 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 and, and had a great experience there. I think um, you're like I'm sure they'll hear that and say, "Oh, yeah, we still like Sabine. Yeah, yeah. I hope so. <laughs> yeah. 
I gotta, gotta pay homage to the overlords, you know. <laughs> I also like homage. you, Gold, Mr. Goldman and Sachs. <laughs> yes, there are two of them. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think uh, you know sometimes things are planned. Sometimes they sort of happen, um, and you know, I, I will say, you know, prior after undergrad, prior to business school, you know, was an operator worked at a bunch of startups. You know, when I went to business school, one of the reasons was I felt like I was always on the tech side of things, but didn't really understand or wasn't even invited to the conversations around, you know, what was happening from a finance business, um, raising capital. Picture. Yeah, knowing thing. the whole picture of like how this thing comes That's together. That's right. right. And so that was a driver for business school. And then ultimately, right after business school, a driver to go to investment banking, which is just a great place to... You know, it's almost like if you're a technologist, you're way deep in building. And if you're at the investment banking level, you're way in the opposite end, right? The, you know, raising capital, exiting companies, you know, so it's two almost extremes of this thing and super interesting. And then this venture capital thing is somewhere in the middle, right? Where you're um, certainly involved in the technology Get, you, you know you have to really understand what companies are doing, but you're also thinking about how to finance these things and, and and whatnot. So I think to me it was just a great hybrid and and a place that I could still geek out on the tech, but also geek out on the numbers and the finance. And that and that was the natural sort of hybrid that led me to venture capital in general. And and so I loved every was, bit of it. Was there any like roots from your youth? I mean, you grew yeah. up in in like Buffalo. Like nobody lives in Buffalo. So, <laughs> yeah, well, there's some, but <laughs> don't worry. I grew up in New Hampshire. I know. I know. So, um, well, you know, I think, I think like roots from my youth more from a tech perspective, less from a finance, you know, from a finance perspective. I think from a tech perspective, I was, you know, nerd in Buffalo, you know, online bulletin board systems, um, spent a lot of like high school time doing all that. And I'll see you with that guy. It was always interesting because you know, a little bit of an outsider Indian guy in Buffalo, and you get on these little online things, and all of a sudden you're connected to a whole bunch of people around the world who are like like you, which you didn't have in Buffalo. So what was your yeah. AOL IM name? Like Jim oh. Ketley Lover 49? <laughs> I think it was something cheesier. I think it was like Stingray because I've as I've always been a Corvette guy. So so I think I was like Stingray something was my okay. was my was my handle. That checks out. <laughs> it could have been Jim Kelly Lover too. <laughs> St Stingray 73. Yeah, something 70. like that. Just something like that. <laughs> but it was Stingray. I remember that. Um, so yeah, I think that was it. It was just like the, you know, it sounds cheesy, but the connectivity force of the, you know, the early, early, early days of internet was, at least for me as a kid, was um, really empowering right you're you know you're, all of a sudden you're like wow there's all these other people that i can connect with that were interesting more like me and you know you know kind of hang with and and that was you know i think i think a little bit of a, at least a tech driver um i don't think there's anything that was like a finance driver it just sort of happened i think being a part of startup companies and you started to see that you know there's these fancy people that will walk into boardrooms and just curiosity and intrigue of like, what do they do and how do they do it? But, that, but I, 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 I find that to be really cool. Like just that feeling, like in terms of a spark, I really identify with that, like that feeling of getting on Instant Messenger for the first time or that feeling of ICQ and like all these ways of just immediate or IRC chat. Like, I don't know how... <laughs> how, yeah, yeah. how deep your nerd goes in, in terms of that stuff, but it was that instant ability to find community and anything that you were interested in was like, was, was empowering such a great word. It just felt like, Oh wow, I'm not alone here in Northern for us, New England, yeah. New Hampshire, um, surrounded by all white people. <laughs> right. Right. And Buffalo, and, you know, you can, in the snow yeah. surrounded by, yeah. 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 And you know, <laughs> the lake but, effect. <laughs> lots of snow. How did that, how did that part specifically translate into you d diving into tech? Like what it, 
Well, I like think that th- that was sort of a, you know, like all yeah, these like, little mini like steps. How come you, how come you didn't become a doctor? And, You're supposed to be a doctor. Yeah, I know. Uh, I know. We all were. We all, none of us. We were all, we were all, we're all, doctor, we're all right? failures on this podcast. <laughs> yeah. Let's be honest. <laughs> That's right. Uh, well, I think like it just, it just sparks other things where right? you're like, well, you know, built games, right? Because it was fun to do and there was people that I could share them with who would play them and try them, right? So that was fun and and entertaining and got people to engage around stuff. So I think that turned into like programming and programming, you know, was developed interest in computer science and, um, uh, you know, in like early days of shareware stuff where you're like, well, you know, build a game and see if someone will pay for it, right? And, and so all that is, you know, it's like one step to another to another to, I should go study to be a, computer science, electrical engineer, you know, at that time it was called computer engineering is what I studied. Right. And it was the mix of those things, but it was all started from those little steps to, you know, programming and writing games. I remember like, I remember like one summer, you know, it was probably junior high summer. Like I, I went to like summer school to go learn, you know, learn to program and, and different things. Right. So it was hyper nerdy, but you know, wanted to do it. And it was super fun. Was there a thing where, like, because you were doing this, you met people like you, you could all of a sudden go from being, like, in a lot of our life, I can tell you in my life, when I all of a sudden felt accepted Mm -hmm. growing up, this happened really during my 16th birthday, I felt super accepted, all of a sudden I burst out and wanted to be more connected to people. So did you have the same kind of experience at that camp or maybe when you got on your first bulletin board that, you know, you went from maybe like, well, I'm being judged and people are looking at me in a particular way, but no, but now all of a sudden you're like, you found people like you and you felt open and accepted. So now you wanted to give back to them. Yeah, a little bit. I think, I think it's right. Or just, or it was just like a, wow, this is actually okay to do. Or I, you know, I could do this with friends, you know, like, um, you know, and I think at some point you started to gravitate and, 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 and have more of a community, like you said, of people who are interested in the same things you are, right. Um, uh, and, and writing a game and then having your friends try it, which is a very, very small, small group of people, but nonetheless, um, yeah, I think, I think you're right. Like feeling accepted, but feeling like, you know, this thing doesn't have to be something you do as a hermit in a closet there's actually other people like this as well it's just harder to find them once you find them you've got just like i said acceptance and and and, um and and, uh, yeah i think uh, as you and i both are extroverts it's you know sometimes it can be hard to be an extrovert in something that's very nerdy (laughs) yeah does this does this translate to the stuff you do today like in the sense of like okay you're i assume you're looking at all these pitch decks or these you know um, companies or uh, mm-hmm. or entrepreneurs, right? You're probably looking at thousands of this stuff to decide who you're going to invest in or make these, uh, you know, offers to you to to, yep. to offer liquidity. It's like, are you looking for that same spark in them, you know, that you had as a kid into like in their ventures? Like, how 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 does that translate to what you're doing today, or or is it just you know, yeah, money, uh, money, money? We're all you know. <laughs> <laughs> See, I, I always, I'd say a different twist on that question is how did that translate for you to get every corporate discount code? Oh, wow. Well, <laughs> wait, wait, what's this? How do you do that? Hold on. I got to write this down. Thing. Yeah. So this is the, <laughs> that's a whole different ball game, which is, uh, you know, we talk about this all the time, but, and I actually, uh, I'll come back to that. I had this epiphany just this past weekend, which, 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 which we're talking about, but you know, I think like. I've always been cheap. I've always been frugal. And uh, I always joke around, but also somewhat serious about this. You know, one of the things about the secondary world is you're typically buying these things discount. And I'm always like, I don't pay full price for anything. And sure as hell, I don't want to pay full price for, for stock as well. Maybe it's the same hack. You know, when I was in high school, we'd call, you know, you'd call people who are kind of writing software hackers and, and you're sort of, you know, hacking and hacking computers. So it's, maybe it's that same mentality of just hacking the system and finding yeah, It's like life hacking, yeah. travel hacks, like people do loopholes. that kind of, yeah, yeah looking yeah. for the, I think there's a dopamine rush when you, when you get, 
you know, a great deal, right? Totally. Uh, totally. And it doesn't matter what it is. Yeah. You yeah. feel like you, you, you got the person, even if you're like <laughs> bargaining in, 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 in uh, Baroda for a tchotchke that you want to bring home to your kids or something. And you're like, yeah, oh yeah, man, yeah, I, they started at 30 and I got it for three. Um, right. you, you, you get that little dopamine hit of like, of the win, right? Yeah, probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's, I think that's accurate. <laughs> it's a game. <laughs> so even like when, uh, here's a good one. So is that like when you, you talked about one of your usernames was uh, the Stingray? Yes. So your dream, I think, was to get a, a Stingray. I did. Yes. Yes. And, and did you and negotiate had... to get that Stingray? <laughs> like a car? I did, but it wasn't, it was like, it was within my strike zone. But yes, I, I, uh, I had like a poster of this old Corvette in my wall when I was a okay. kid. And, okay. The car. So yellow, a yellow. yellow For a while, I, I, was thinking you, I, I was thinking it was the, an, an, an actual uh, pet Stingray, but okay, go on. Oh, no, no, no. no, no <laughs> in Sumit's no. case, it could be actually. Could be. No, 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 no. <laughs> no. The Corvette Stingray. And yes, I have a, you know, that same old Corvette now that, uh, which is not a fancy car by any means, but it's, you know, it's a cool car that I like. <laughs> it, goes zero, it goes zero to 60 in how many seconds? I don't know. Minutes. Minutes. <laughs> minutes. <laughs> but it hours. makes a lot of noise, oh, noise doing it. Yeah. It's so cool. It takes four and, and a half hours fuel. to go to 60 miles an hour. <laughs> um, so going back to your epiphany, because you oh, feel yes. like you're going somewhere. Yeah. Where, where oh, is yeah, that? Yeah. At? So this past weekend, I was at... I was in the Bahamas with my wife on our 20th anniversary. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. For, Super fun time. To, to her for yeah, so yeah, putting sticking it out. With you. Yeah. And so um and and so I'm gonna I'm gonna come back to this and and I'm gonna put it put a pin in it and then come back and, and stepping aside for one second, one of the things when I first met Rajiv and we were on the stop stock club, I would joke around about this great invite this best advice I had. My great investment advice is buy low, sell high. Isn't that brilliant? Right. That's oh, the advice. I've never heard that before. Buy Incredible. low, buy, sell high. Sorry, I got to write this down. Buy, yeah, buy low, low okay, sell high. Well, the, so, the, rea- the reality is, okay, Sumit and I, I'll tell you a little about the stock club thing. So a bunch of us bored during the pandemic, couldn't travel places, couldn't go out, couldn't do much of anything. So Saturday mornings at 9 a.m., some, some one of our close friends, Tom, organized a stock club so that he's like, well, if we can't go out, at least maybe we can profit by this pandemic and and talk about our notions of where our businesses should be. And so it was kind of a business geek fest and we had fun yeah. with it, right? And, and so, yeah. but I, I'll tell you, one of the things I found is people love to buy high and then sell low. That's right. That's right. That people people get excited at the wrong times. So people get excited at the wrong times. Like, wow, this thing's really hot. Buy. And then it can only go one way once you've bought it at the peak, right? So, so yeah. And I'd always say, simple advice, buy low, sell high. So that so that so I want to come back to that. Now I'm gonna come back to this weekend. So it was sitting at um at, at a bar before dinner. And it, we were at this resort where there's lots of people celebrating anniversaries. People just got married, and there was this 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 uh, this guy who um, had just gotten married a couple of days ago. Was there on their honeymoon, and he's like, "What what marriage advice do you have? You've been married for 20 years." And I was thinking about it, trying to think about like something, and then You're trying to come up with something super profound. Uh, you yeah, saying? yeah. And then it, and then I was like, you know what? Here's my advice. Don't sell low. <laughs> and he's like, what do you mean? And and my wife was right next to me. I'm like, you know, um, I, I, you know, I, student of Warren Buffett and et cetera. And, and uh, one of the things I saw at his annual meeting was that I just went to was, you know, the best opportunities are when other people do stupid things. So, so that was one. And then, and then two, you know, I was just saying, look, one of the things I'm most thankful for is in my marriage, when there's times I've done stupid things, my wife didn't sell low and said, you're out of here, kick me out of the house, right? But, you know, and, and, and I would say that she's really appreciative and I am too, that, you know, if you don't give up when things are really bad, quote, sell low, you got a good shot. And then the other, you know, this, this other, so should you know, the correlate, that the, so, so it's so always should, lightest yeah. one after it's most dark, right? Which yeah. is... So, so that, that was just correlating this to other things, right? Which is, it's kind of in the secondary business, you know, frankly, a lot of what I do is 
is buy low, right? When somebody else has to sell low and they have to sell low because, you know, there's a life event or it's the end of life of their fun. And that, and I kind of, I don't want to say take advantage of it, but that's, that's, that's what you leverage. And then, you know, and I was thinking about that from a venture capital and a business perspective, which is there's only one reason companies go out of business. That's they run out of money. And, you know, and what's the implication of that? You know, don't run out of money because when you run out of money, you have to sell low. And so, you know, anyhow, so that those are all the different things that I started to connect. And I was like, that's my advice is don't sell low if you can in life. And, you know, and, and, it, you know, and I, and I was, uh, I was actually thinking of you, Rajiv, as well, when I was driving here and I was thinking about this, this, this other example, which you'll appreciate, which was, you know, Patriots in 1994, right? When Robert Kraft bought them. And that was when the bills were on top of the world. They were crushing the Patriots every year, went to four Super Bowls in a row. And I believe Foxborough Stadium was bankrupt or was or was about to, was declaring bankruptcy. And Robert Kraft jumped in, bought the team for I don't remember exactly. Around it's like two two hundred million dollars, right? which actually was a high price at the time. At the time, yeah. at the time. But I'd argue he bought low. The the company or the you know the oh, team had never won. Low. The stadium was basically bankrupt. Piece of junk. Yeah, a piece of junk. And now it's you know one of the top five most valuable franchises. You know, multi billion dollars in twenty yeah. years. It's not. I mean, it's a long time. Not a lot of time. But anyhow. Another example. He, kn- he knew of, seven years from then he would draft a quarterback in the <laughs> sixth round. That would be the right. best player of all time. I, I, okay. <laughs> but and I don't know who he bought it from, but whoever he bought it from is man, kicking themselves. Yeah. S- s- yeah. Sold low, right? So, you know, so, so, so great. Low. You know, I always think of if you can't buy low and in life, try not to sell low. <laughs> <laughs> and those are my those that was my epiphany for my wedding weekend that I'm now applying to other things. <laughs> there you go. I love it. I love it. So now, um, is there like nowadays you're still investing in all these firms and you're looking at the next thing? Do you think AI is a sell, is a is a high or is it at a low or is it in a is it in that crazy territory like crypto was last year? Or the year before, where, where I, would you put that from what I you've seen the, across all these um, technologies? Yeah, are you t- are you saying buy crypto? That's at a low. <laughs> That's low. <laughs> that is low. Actually, it's had a local. It's had a little it's local. It's had a local peak. high, right? Yeah. It's had a local high at like after the banks, uh, Silicon Valley Bank. After that, it kind of Bitcoin peaked a bit. Mm. I think we're in this, you know, the, the classic Gartner curves. You know, the and I, I don't remember the, the exact terms, but it's like the. Trough of peak of inflated and infl- inf- you know inflated expectations, and then it goes to trough of illusionment, and then so I think we're in that peak of inflated expectation, which is um, there's something very real. It's well, I should say something. We've all used these things, and it's incredibly powerful, and it's all blown away. You know, it's what is all way about what what we can do and where we th- how fast it's evolving. What we how we're adapting business around it. I think the the um, peak of inflated expectation is just around you know how quickly we're building another bubble. Um, it's it's amazing. I can't think of I I don't know if I can think of another time when one bubble is is collapsing at the same time another one's being built. Right, where we're seeing all of these companies that were overfunded, overvalued, and during the pandemic. You know, quickly collapsing or compressing, and at the same time, we're building a brand new bubble and and this other th- and, this, and this other thing, and so that's so. So you're not buying. You're not buying any generative AI, large language model companies. Yeah, I don't. I mean, I look, I, they're still early. There's they're not an mature enormous enough. amount of potential. Yeah, they're not mature enough. For, Even though some for, of them have gotten ten billion dollars. Of capital, of hundreds capital. of billion, billions of hundreds yeah, of millions yeah, of, of capital, of capital. Now, that doesn't mean they have hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue, right? But they have capital. It's easy to use your imagination and see how these things can displace all sorts of things. Companies like Google, who you know, well, not displace, but just from a search perspective, to you know, traditional marketing, all, all sorts of different things that we see all over the place. Um, so I, you know. I think it's very real. 
unlike crypto where, you know, great, we bought, like, didn't change anyone's life. It wasn't, nobody really, no one's day-to-day was impacted. It's not like I went to work when crypto was here and, and. Unless you, bought money, unless you bought money at the peak, uh, unless you bought this stuff at a peak. Sure. But, but yeah. even that, yeah. But even that, like, but even that but it even didn't that, change just, your world. It, it, didn't, cha- it yeah. didn't change what I was doing. Every, it didn't change. It changed nothing other than it was just another asset that I was buying and selling. It wasn't like the promise of, you know, Web3 and blockchain and all this stuff. The promise of it all was, you know, we're going to reinvent businesses without there being, in, you know, um, an intermediary where everything can be peer-to-peer. None of that really, really happened. So nothing really changed. I think what we're seeing now is, yeah, stuff is changing. You know, I'm I'm using ChatGPT all the time. I use it everything to help my kids with their homework, to help me compose emails, to you know, all over the place. And, I'm, and I want to incorporate it more. So I think that's very, very, very different. Right, the adoption and the utility. Right, I'm not just. There's other things we've probably all adopted just because it was cool, right, for a little bit, but it wasn't providing a ton of utility. Like there was a what it was, there was this, everyone for, everyone for about two weeks was in audio chat rooms. You know, yeah. Clubhouse, et cetera. The clubhouse. And, was, and who wants to go sit there and listen to a bunch of yeah. guys? Just, just listen to a bunch of guys. And then that quickly degraded. It was, the quality was low and it was a waste of time. And that, you know, but, so that's, use that as an example, this is not, right? Where I'm like, this is actually useful and productive and, and, and there's real utility. So I, so now, so, we, so, so now you're thinking about, so AI, it's on its rise. It may be something you look for when they get to a certain point. You may be act- may actually able to take care of a or be engaged in a in a, a situation where they rise enough before they go public. There'll be people wanting to get out, and you'll be able to help them. Yeah. Um, so now, uh, let's. So that that's a that's a huge right opportunity and situation. So now, how does that all relate to uh, buying a nail printer for your dog? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> so Sumit's into all kinds what? of innovation. So Sumit, as, as, Sumit yes. as you know, is into all kinds of innovation. And uh, like your uh, fingernails. He, yeah, he yes, and I were at South. He and I were at oh, cool. South by Southwest. That was South yeah, by South two, South uh, last and, year. And yeah. the great part about going with Sumit is that because he's a he's in venture, I get into all the good parties. Right. Oh, okay. So we were at his party, and there were people there selling, hawking this new technology. And Sumit, ever the innovator, said, "I gotta have this." Yes, it was. It's basically like an inkjet printer for fingernails, and and it was like this is March, and my daughter's my middle daughter's birthday is April fifth. So I was like, "What a great birthday present to come home with like a like a little nail printer." And uh, um, so first of all, we you know we went there, and I had her print the Bills logo on my nails. So so that was my first step to see how it worked, and it worked great. I had like. The Bill's logo on my fingernails, and, and he, he had to show everyone when he was yes. there, showing all the women there yeah. that he <laughs> had his everyone, nails painted. Everyone, yeah, yeah. everyone. And, uh, just sorry, ch- women and men, he was yes, showing yes. them. Yes, the, it was real part of the Bill's logo, and then uh, I think you even had me put on a Patriots one on mine. I think so. I think so. Yeah. And then just Josh uh, Allen faces on on all your. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yep, and then uh, yeah, then I'm like, I need to, you know, I, I, I you know, need to buy one daughter's birthday and she's like well they're still in prototype mode i'm like that's okay i'll I'm write in. you lots of great reviews whatever you need and she's kind enough the ceo of the company you know sold me one sent it to me and it was awesome so <laughs> so who uses it more you or your daughter is it kind of like that mm. amazing margarita machine you bought for yeah, your wife? Super- <laughs> <laughs> all the stuff wow you know all the things um <laughs> Definitely, she does. It actually works. She she uses it when she has like friends over. It's like an activity. She's like, you know, got friends over. They're like, hey, let's go print our nails, and, and they go do it. But then she, uh, she's super cute. She's uh, she was starting up a a nail gloss business, an online right. nail gloss. That's business. right. That's right. We had friend. Rajiv over to. I, I said, you know what? Luckily for you, I have friends who are great at different walks of life and I have a great person who's like a phenomenal digital marketer and you know starting on my business get some advice and, and Raji was kind of come over and provide lots of advice on a b testing different things and yeah yeah but she she's like the consummate operator she came up with this amazing glitter 
glitter nail polish. So I was pretty excited. Yeah. Pretty excited. So like, okay, before we close up, one thing, I actually have some personal things. So, sure. so you came out of Buffalo. From what I hear from your friends, you were somewhat of a shy guy. But then things changed. And maybe now, now that we've talked about it, we've learned it's rooted in this whole network, uh, the, this whole ability to do bulletin boards. Right. So how, when you, one of the amazing things I think about you is that when you go to parties, all of a sudden you become the life of the party. How does that hmm. happen? I think like I, I, I somehow just see the hilarity in everything. And somehow there's always comedy available and... And it's not, it's not, not, it's not an act for anyone, but just always laughing about the stuff around. And there's always something humorous, right? Whatever it may be. Mm. There's, um, I can't you know, relate as a comedian. I'm a tortured soul. I, I don't. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of times it's self deprecating, right? It just, it's just the, it's just the funny things that you see, the funny things people do are, you know, the funny things amongst our friends that we know, the different mannerisms and, and, uh, um, I don't know. I think I think I think when everyone's laughing, it's good. And you know, as you know, you know sometimes the ridiculousness of, um, you know, of, of those silly observations, yeah, work well. That's it. All right. So here's here's one final question. Sure. If you say you were not doing venture anymore, mm. what what thing would you do? I think it would be other than having a beer with Rajiv. Yes, yes, yes. That would be amazing. Always. <laughs> um, I, so I, I, there's two answers. What one is maybe a little more serious, but maybe, I think so. Thing one would be um, building, building and repairing cars. I would love to be like you know. I still I'm a very hands on with my own cars and do you know change oils and do all the, all that stuff. So I would, I would love to go build, race, drive, so cars. So that, 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 that would be one, which I think I still love to do and would love to do more of. And then the second thing is maybe a little more serious would be, you know, I'm super fascinated by certainly all the AI stuff, but also everything that's happening right now around robotics and drones and, Condom is driving and, you know, you, you go around San Francisco and you just see these like just amazing vehicles by Cruz and Waymo and, and all these things that are just like, it's just, just so much amazing technology sensors, all that stuff. So I would try to go back, put my engineering hat back on and find some way to, you know, get involved in the engineering building something of that part of the world of the, you know, whatever it is, drones, vehicles, autonomous, all those sorts of things I think are super cool. And I'm the engineering part of me, every time I see one of those, my jaw drops. I'm like, you see these cars with like, you know, all their LIDAR sensors spinning and all that stuff. And you're like, that is just so cool. I'd like love to. It is the most fun ever to see all this change and transformation right before our eyes. Software and hardware coming together, making amazing stuff happen. Uh, drones that can see, drones that can act together. Yeah. I think like if I go back in time, if I go back in time to when I was studying engineering in college and, and I saw like what is what you can do today, I think I probably would have just stayed an engineer. Maybe. Right? Like, maybe. I think, like, when I, I, I graduated. I, you know, yeah. I wonder the same thing. Like had I not been in New Hampshire and been here in Silicon Valley, maybe I would have actually stayed in engineering. Yeah. Maybe. Because I, I think at the time when I graduated, it was like, well, you know, engineering it wasn't that exciting it was like you know there was power lines it was a grind was man. yeah it, it was, was painful like, you know <laughs> go work on chip design and and like and not that exciting you know it was like or you go work at an auto company but working an auto company working on you know seat belts or something right incremental improvements yeah yeah, yeah. so that Amazing. now the stuff that you can do you know That'd be awesome, right? Can you imagine like graduating from engineering school and go work at SpaceX? Like that'd be so cool. So damn. Yeah, see a see a spaceship land itself. It's amazing. Right, 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 right. Is AI going to be the great hope for civilization? Or has it already killed us and we're just sitting in a simulation? <laughs> 
I think it's I think it's gonna be a good thing. I think it's a great hope. I think uh, um, I hope that AI will uh, drive us to more truth and to more fact, and uh, and I think that'll be good. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, simulations awesome. can be fun. Yeah. <laughs> we might just be in a simulation. So I think our next simulation is going to be uh, enjoying uh, Sumit's uh, margarita making machine. Yes. So I think that's what we're off that's to next. All right. Thank you so much. Wasn't that fun? We got to learn all about friends that you can make during the pandemic and how you get to learn about how they're changing the world. So in Sumit's case, I got to learn all about the investing world in a fundamentally different way, a different sector of the economy, not just stocks and startups, but the intersections between startups and how they get to market and how there's so many players in between and how, much so, how, how there's so much innovation in between. And I think he does it in a way that most people have never thought of. Like he, he was motivated by his youth and how that innovation came from being this kid, Indian kid in Buffalo that happened to find bulletin boards and write code and use that to find so many people like him and so many friends like him that he's made a whole living and life off of. Totally. I think I feel, I honestly feel like we like a little bit reconnected him with his, to that moment in his life. So I'm patting myself and you and you on the back a little bit of being like, oh, this is cool. This is a cool thing we're doing. I think reminding people like, what is the thing that 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 brought you in here? Because I think it's easy to get lost in balance sheets and assets. I'm sure in finance, it's probably very easy to get lost in that stuff and forget why you're there. And you know, bringing people back to that thing. And 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 I think what I did learn from Sumit, you know, is like, and I try to do in my life as a comedian, right? Is like keep it fun. Be loud, be proud. And I think that can make all the difference in the world. So that was super fun. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed the pod, please take a moment to rate it and comment. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and everywhere podcasts can be found. We'll catch you next time. And remember, folks, be ever curious. Be ever curious.